It says, Thus saith the Lord. And here's what God says. Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard. I don't care what the devil throws at you. Uh, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria, they blasphemed me. All those textbooks that, we, that we've read, those stupid novels that we've read, all those things that are fed to our kids, they blaspheme our God. You don't need to believe it. You don't need to listen to it. You don't need to be afraid of it. The fear of the Lord is all you need. That means you're, you're staying close to Him. And, and His power is wrapped around you. Uh, verse 7, Behold, I, the Lord, will send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor. He'll return to his own land. And I'll cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. God says, I know something about lost people. They love rumors. They're stupid. They'd rather listen to rumors than truth. They'd rather hear a lie than the truth. They'd rather the, the spirit of error than the spirit of truth. By the way, is that you? We didn't want you to be. You know what rumors are going to cause for you? They're going to cause you to go to the wrong place and fall. God uses those to draw the idiots like hooks in their nose. That's what the devil's trying to do with you. This rumor of the coronavirus and this rumor of wearing a mask and all these rumors and people walking around. He's got hooks in everyone's nose. Listening to rumors rather than the Word of God. You remember when this thing started in March? We're not supposed to meet. God said we're supposed to meet. I got a rumor here. I got truth here. Let me see. What am I going to listen to? This is not difficult. You listen to a rumor or the word of the Lord? If the Lord said, I don't want you meeting, we don't meet. If the Lord says, I I'm in my house. I'm building it. Two or more there. I'm gathered. I forsake not the assembling of the fellowship. I'm worthy of worship. Okay, then if God's worthy of worship... Do you think they stopped services during the bubonic plague? Do you think they stopped them during the Spanish flu? Those were real pandemics. Not this phony baloney thing that's neither a pandemic nor an epidemic. It's neither. Even the CDC admitted it about uh, three weeks ago. It, it's neither pan nor epidemic. You listen to rumors? By the way, that's what the news is. Don't, don't waste your time with the news. Listen to the word of the Lord. The Lord encourages. He gives the assurance of the ultimate eternal victory. Now he also gives them assurance of a, of a near-term victory over the king of Assyria. But the Lord's doing that for a purpose. The Assyrians were getting ready to attack. You've got to go back to uh, the beginning of this book, Isaiah 1 just to, to understand what God's doing. Say, oh, God's going to give them the big victory. No, he's going to give them a very short-term victory. Very small, a breather, and it's for a purpose. Isaiah uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished up and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Verse 4, they are a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, a children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They're gone away backwards. Uh, welcome to modern Christianity. So God said, I'll give you a short-term victory. Why did you give that to us, Lord? Uh, so you got a little time to repent and get right. I told you folks back here, you go back and dig up the tapes when the election was in 2016 between that, that bimbo Hillary Clinton and, uh, and Donald Trump. And there is no question, Trump is a good president. He's a fine president. Uh, from a political standpoint, that man is a good president. And even from a spiritual standpoint, he does two things correct. Number one, he stands for the nation Israel, which God is very high on. Read the book, both Old and New Testament. And number two, he's pro-life, which God also is very high on. And so from that standpoint, God says, I like what that guy's doing. There may be many other things. Maybe I don't like what he's doing. I'd like him to get saved. I'd like him to be a priest in his family. But from that standpoint where he is, I'm pleased with him as opposed to most of the people you've had for the last 50 years. But I told you, 
I said, I know, I know what you're doing. You guys don't want Clinton, and not just you. I'm speaking to all Christians. And you want Trump. But I'm telling you, I'll tell you what's going to happen. If God gives you that victory with Trump, you better use it to get close to God. Because God is not saving America with Donald Trump. God is merely giving a space to his church to get right and live right. If Trump turns that economy around, which I told you, he will because all he's got to do is get rid of a few regulations and a few taxes and the economy will ramp up and you get more money in your paychecks. You better not be running off getting new cars and new boats and second homes. You better be putting this into God's work. That's why God gave the space for repentance. It wasn't for your comfort, your pleasure, your convenience and your entertainment. God doesn't think that way. He doesn't work that way. And that's exactly what he's doing here with Isaiah and Hezekiah and, and Assyria. He's going to give them a space to say, now you're going to turn around? You know what? They're not going to. You read the next book, they're going down. Do you know what's going to happen to America? It's going down. You know what's happened to the American church? If it wasn't for God pulling the last few parts out of the toilet, it would go down too. None of this is prepared other than the notes. When I get up here, things happen. So, <laughs> Isaiah 37, verse 8. Really, I'm trying to be your friend by telling you the truth. So Rabshakeh returned. Now this is the ambassador from Assyria. He had just come to Jerusalem. He had given them the threat. Uh, he went back to his king and he found uh, the king of Assyria now was warring against Libna. For he, Rabshakeh, heard that he was departed out of Lachish. The last time he left the king, the king was in Lachish. I imagine when a king goes somewhere, they set him up with first class, uh, you know, uh, stayings and, and all that. And, and he's real nice, got a beautiful tent. He's got everything going on. And, and he sends Rabshakeh out and he expects to come back and find the king where he is and the king's not there anymore because now there's so-called a war broken out. Uh, verse 9, he had heard say concerning Tir Haka, the king of Ethiopia, he came forth to make war with thee and when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah. So here's what happened. The Ethiopians... If you remember correctly from last week, the Assyrians were sweeping from the east across to the west. They came across and they took all kinds of lands, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Israel, and they want to get down to take Africa because there are some resources they want from the Nile Delta. They want Egypt. And so they're trying to make their way down into Egypt. And what's standing in their way is the land of Judah because Judah's right at the hub there of the three continents. So that's why they said, look, it, tell Judah we're going to knock you out, we're going to take you, make you a vassal state on our way to Egypt. And that's what's going on here. Well, here's what happened. Down in Egypt, the Ethiopians figured, look, if we get together with the Egyptians and we combine our armies, we might be able to withstand this Assyrian. See, skin for skin, all that a man will, uh, will have, he'll give for his life and give for his possessions. And so those are lost people getting ready, trying to figure out what's the best way to deal with this. Let's get together and we'll maybe fight this guy off. So, so uh, when the ambassador finds, oh my goodness, the army that was supposed to go to Judah is now down there uh, warring in, in Libna, trying to work its way down into Egypt and Ethiopia. They went through the Sinai Peninsula. He sends a message back, verse 10. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them utterly. Shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, such as the gods of Gozan and Haran and Reseph and the children of Eden which were in Talasar? Where's the king of Hamath? Where's the king of Arphad and the kings of the city of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva? In other words, what he's saying is you got a, a space here where my king is not coming against you. Don't get the idea we're not coming back. If, if you fight off that first attack of the devil and he goes away, 
He'll send a message through someone else, I'm coming back to get you. He is not going to give up on this battle. He intends to continue to pursue you. He wants to know if the first threat didn't work, I'm going to have a second threat. I'm going to have a third one. I'm going to, I'm relentless. You know how long this will go on? Till he's shut up in the bottomless pit that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. As long as he's alive and breathing and has his minions, the devils with him, he's going to send threats your way. That's why you need the helmet of salvation, why you need the shield of faith, and you can't ignore that, but he wants you to believe him rather than God. He wants you to be afraid of his rumor rather than trust in God and the power of your God. So he's just trying one more time with a psyops warfare against uh, the king Hezekiah. And by the way, he is serious. He is eventually going to come. He is eventually going to make his move. He eventually will serve the papers or whatever it is he does in this world to do what he's going to do. All you need to do is stand with God like Hezekiah 